Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Katherine Steitel. Dr. Steitel is a scholar in residence at the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Having earned her PhD from Brown University's Institute for Archaeology and the Ancient World in 2018, she's an expert in the archaeology of the ancient Mediterranean. In particular, her work has been focused on the emergence of Greek colonies in the Archaic period, from Ionia to the shores of Spain and France. We discuss the intermingling of Greek colonial communities with local populations and the way ancient migrations can help inform modern social issues. Without further ado, I'm Sebastian Weatherby, and this is The Tell. Hey, Katie. Hi. Thanks for joining me. (laughs) Thanks for having me. (laughs) When I was trying to think about how to open this, because it seems like your work is really big in scope, and it also deals with a lot of pretty abstract kind of theoretical issues. So, so I spent a while trying to figure out how to lead into it, and where I ended up at is just, but to start with, how did you become interested in Greek archaeology? Like, chart the course from where you first dipped your toe into that kind of archaeology, and when did you start running into the kind of research questions that you have now? How did they first present themselves to you? Yeah, so... Um... You're not alone. I think my work is a little bit out there for lots of Greek archaeologists. <laughs> um, so I, well, so I was a uh, archaeology major as an undergraduate at Wesleyan University, where they have an awesome archaeology program, and my certainly my freshman year. I took a course on the Archaic Age, which is sort of uh, like 800, I mean, you know, chronology is iffy, but sort of 800-ish to 480 BC. Right, kind of after the Bronze Age collapse and the sort of Dark Age that follows the disappearance of writing. This is sort of the the new ramp up again. Exactly. So post-Bronze Age collapse... Um, and then uh, pre, pre-classical period, it sort of ends with the Persian sack of the Acropolis. So mm-hmm. you've got a lot of interesting social changes happening in that period and also um, kind of material culture changes yeah. um, and sort of the, the development of um, what will come to be considered kind of high classical you know, art, painted pottery, sculpture, yeah. most of the stuff that you see in, in museums um, or the stuff that you see getting the most attention in major international museums. So I took a course on the Archaic Age with Selena Gray, shout out to Professor Gray, um, and it completely hooked me from a material culture point of view. Yeah. So I had I had gotten to college knowing I wanted to study archaeology, um, and I was pretty dead set on on Mediterranean archaeology from Mm -hmm. that point on. Um, And when I applied to, I applied to graduate school um, a year after I graduated from college, thinking that I wanted to do Mediterranean archaeology and that I was, you know, interested in like vase painting and (laughs) archaic sculpture and kind of art objects, aesthetic objects, which are, fascinating and you know a super valid uh topic of study right specialism in these things is really important but i got to brown and was quickly introduced to peter van damelen who Mm -hmm. had just arrived who's one of the sort of major post-colonial theory people working in the mediterranean who works all over, but um, especially sort of in the far west on Sardinia and and is really a specialist in kind of the far western Mediterranean. It completely changed the way that I thought about archaeology, focusing less on the aesthetic values of artifacts and more on kind of anthropological questions that you can ask about, you know, um, people and ideas and, and concepts that aren't so directly represented in the material record. That That kind of reminds me of a a quote from David Hurst Thomas. Archaeology is not what you find, it's what you find out. Yes, (laughs) yes. Um, That is, I mean, 
don't get me wrong, I will spend, you know, an hour walking through, like, the room full yeah. of painted vases and a museum because I love them. But, uh, yeah, but I'm really interested in sort of the anthropological side of mm-hmm. um, archaeology in the Mediterranean and of the Greek world, which is um, now a much more common approach, but definitely not the traditional approach to yeah. Greek archaeology. Speaking of your approach, I know that you work a lot studying uh, ancient Greek colonies, but but uh, what are your interests within that? Yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm really interested in, I'm interested in collective identity yeah. and sort of communities. Mm-hmm. And in particular, um, not exclusive to, but especially in the period of the first millennium BC, when you mm-hmm. have a lot of Greek mobility and movement Mm -hmm. out of the Aegean to points west and north and south. What happens when Greek speakers from the Aegean run into other people, especially at settlements like um, Emporion in Spain, which I've just been talking about with my students, you know, how when you've got a bunch of people from different backgrounds who come together to sort of cohabit in a space relatively permanently or over multiple generations, how do they start to see one another as being more similar than different? Right. And kind yeah. of shift the the principal kind of identifier for themselves away from um, away from what might be an ethnic identity mm-hmm. to, you know, like Greek or a linguistic identity to something that's more common between them, basically. This is a very fluid way of thinking about identity. In the 19th and 20th centuries, they were focused on very immutable, big categories like, like races and cultural blocks. And, and this thing you're talking about is a lot more, uh, seems like it's a lot more complex and a lot more nuanced. Uh, and I, I guess going off of that point, here, here's a quote of yours that I found that I was kind of hoping you might... Uh, be willing to unpack for us a little bit. Okay, so here it is. If the goal is to categorize people so that we might understand their relatedness to, and ultimately their interactions with one another, then an understanding of identity that is rooted in that interaction is more effective than one rooted in ethnicity. Whereas there is no guarantee of ethnicity's relevance or existence in any given social milieu, interaction is universal. Talk us through this point. Yeah, so um, I guess my favorite way to kind of unpack this, if I'm if I'm giving a lecture, um, you know, for for a public audience or for students, is to use a slightly more modern example. Mm-hmm. So, um, in uh, I don't know if if you or your listeners are familiar with the 1923 population exchange between Greece and Turkey, which is something that's not most of my students are not. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not something that gets tends to get covered in history books um, that frequently, but basically, uh, as part of the Treaty of Lausanne after the end of World War One, the governments of sort of the nascent Republic of Turkey mm-hmm. um, and of Greece decided that they would exchange significant components of their population. Um, so, uh, Muslim residents of Greece would be sent back to back. I mean, would be sent to Turkey mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, Orthodox Christian residents of Turkey would be sent to Greece. Um, something like, you know, two, two million people oh, wow. um, moved. So uh, one and a half million people came to Greece from Turkey, and about 500,000 people went from, uh, moved from Greece to Turkey. Wow. So a huge imbalance in, in people who were moving caused significant, you know, economic issues. There were loads of people arriving in Greece who needed to be sort of placed, you know, in, in villages that had been emptied. Um, so there are lots of issues that kind of went into making this really traumatic experience. Um, and that trauma has been passed down intergenerationally, but sort of the key ethnicity related issue is that at that point, you know, the governments and sort of the people who are constructing this treaty considered religion and ethnicity to be pretty much the same thing. Um, And so figured that they were creating more homogeneous populations that would sort of result in more peace, more tranquility, less kind of religious conflict, which was happening in some places. But the stories that people who survived, survived the journey and lived through the exchange tell and that their descendants tell 
is that, you know, they were, if they had been treated poorly because of some religious difference in their home region, they were treated worse um, when they moved back, back. I mean, some of them had been living there for hundreds of years, but when they were sort of returned to the place that the governments considered to be home for them, they were treated very poorly because they were considered to be completely different. Right, right, because they belonged to communities that were formed by more than just race or religion. They had, you know, centuries of cohabitation and all of the culture that that is associated with, like, a local place that people are from. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, the idea is that your any single component of your identity Mm -hmm. isn't really enough to determine whether you quote unquote belong somewhere. Um, And, you know, looking at this example from relatively recent history, all things considered, Mm -hmm. where we actually have a decent sense of kind of sociology of how people, you know, of, of individual identity, collective identity, we have written records, we have, you know, people who can tell us about these experiences orally, Um, you know, it, it, it was pretty <laughs> making assumptions about ethnicity and what it meant went yeah. pretty poorly. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, you know, I always ask, how could we expect our assumptions about ethnicity to mean anything at all for people who were alive 2,500 years ago? Right. <laughs> I mean, the scale of people's identity must have already just been in completely different. Like Absolutely. Since... One piece of my identity, for example, is that I'm an American, which already is this 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 behemoth of a thing with 330 some million people in it and it's one of these these giant national abstractions that i, I assume your your average person in ancient greece in 6 700 bc is not thinking about right they're probably their world is probably much more local and polity or village based i would i would guess Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, there's a lot of discussion among scholars um, who work on periods just slightly later than I do about the development of a panhellenic identity. Mm -hmm. Um, And one of the kind of major theories that uh, a scholar named Jonathan Hall has written a lot about, but others have contributed as well, is the idea that conflict with the Persians, the Persian Wars really helped to crystallize for the first Uh. time a sense of shared kind of collective Greek identity on Mm -hmm. a much wider scale. But prior to that, you know, when people are identifying themselves, when we see them, you know, identified in funerary inscriptions, Mm -hmm. or when we see, you know, writers, artists, whatever identified, it's always person from this place, Mm -hmm. right? So the kind of the polis identity is, and the family identity are much stronger and sort of the, the primary thing that you go back to if you're introducing yourself, you know, to right. a person yeah. somewhere else. Walk me through a little bit what the Greek migrations of this period looked like. Like, when did they start, and why Why are the Greeks putting colonies in the Black Sea and on the coast of Turkey and on the coast of Spain and France and everywhere else that they went? Yeah, so um, this is another question that gets discussed a lot. I think the traditional, the very traditional explanations for, you know, Greek colonization starting in the kind of late 8th, 7th century um, and and into the classical period was that there was some kind of population pressure. Hmm. Um, that has been pretty well debunked as with, I mean, as with most things, it seems like there are a number of factors yeah. that are, that are affecting um, or sort of impacting the choice to to colonize. So um, I think the first important thing to mention, because we're talking about ancient colonization, mm-hmm. and that's a word, obviously, that we yeah, use it's very loaded in, in the historical yeah. sense, is that um, we're not talking about the same type of thing. So yeah. Greek colonization is not a centrally planned mass effort to take over and control as part of any kind of empire, right, um, yeah. you know, the whole Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. They're not even really, you know, generally going out with the intention to um, to exploit a region that they're colonizing, which mm-hmm. is another hallmark of more modern colonization. And yeah. there isn't necessarily any kind of inherent power, technology, wealth, and balance. Yeah. So we call it colonization, but basically it's just founding overseas settlements Sometimes for the purpose of engaging specifically in trade or Mm -hmm. joining overseas settlements um, that are already, you know, inhabited by a bunch of different people. And sometimes it's, you know, going sort of abroad with the intent of just settling a permanent foundation. Um, 
And it could be because there is some kind of population pressure. Um, it's possible that it has to do with sort of growing um, growing social and wealth inequality. And so mm-hmm. making it more difficult for sort of your average person to, um, to own private land to be able to farm Mm -hmm. um because it's kind of being hoarded by by folks and who are members of wealthier classes it could be because there's kind of social strife at home maybe you have a disagreement between inheriting sons and one of them you know decides to go off with a colony uh could be because they're pushed out by other conflict um the yeah so how how would how would groups of colonists actually make that happen would they i guess pool resources to before to ship basically and yeah so the um in terms of initial sort of leaving the mother city there mm-hmm. there does you know there is investment on behalf of yeah. the mother city in many yeah. cases and sometimes you'll have multiple mother cities kind of send colonists oh they're kind of collaborate yeah that that definitely yeah. happens um sometimes you also like in sicily especially mm-hmm. you'll have after the first wave of colonization you will get instances of a Sicilian colony in conjunction with a mother city founding another colony, or huh, even just yeah. a Sicilian colony founding another colony by itself. Yeah. Um, so it really varies, but. And you've, it seems like mostly focused on so far with your research, two areas. So Ionia on the one hand, uh, the uh, Western coast of Turkey, kind of West central coast of Turkey. And then on the other hand, the Northwest coast of the Mediterranean, I guess, Emporion being the main site that you look at in northern Spain, but then I guess it, the kind of region you're interested in sort of runs from there up to Massalia, right? Like yeah. modern-day Marseille? Exactly. Why are you looking at two different ends of the Mediterranean? What's what's the point there? Yeah, um, there are a few different reasons. Uh, so I, I started off interested in Ionia. Mm-hmm. And in particular, I'm interested in Ionia because the the narrative of how it became Greek is very questionable. It's, it's really murky. We don't Mm -hmm. actually understand it very well. So basically what happens in Ionia is um, at the end of the bronze age, you know, Mm -hmm. around 1150, 1200 BC, it is very much part of the Anatolian orbit. Yeah. Um, You know, do you have Greek speakers there? Certainly there's lots of trade going on. There's debate about, even Minoan or Mycenaean presence, but, Mm. you know, regardless, uh, there are, they're engaged with the Aegean, but it's very much part of the Anatolian orbit. Yeah. And then things kind of go dark. (laughs) Um, I hate the term dark ages, but this is why we call it the dark ages. We don't have text. Archaeological preservation isn't great, especially in Ionia. Um, and around, you know, 500 BC, when we start getting things really routinely written around, written down again, when mm-hmm. Herodotus starts writing history, yeah. um, Ionia is very much considered Greek. And so there's this question, you know, over the intervening 600 years, yeah. how, how did, did that, that happen? shift happen? And the traditional explanation is that there was a migration, there was a migration, Mm -hmm. um, a mass migration of people who sort of gathered in Athens. There are several different kind of myth, uh, legendary explanations for why they sailed across to Ionia. They founded a bunch of new cities and they made it Greek because they were already Greek. And so by being there, right, they kind of Hellenized it. Yeah. Um, not well supported by archeological evidence, uh, not terribly logical from the standpoint of thinking about, you know, what happened to all the people who are already living over there. Is this the kind of not super convincing story that for some reason for a long time classicists just sort of mm-hmm. tacitly took as, as true? Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, it's convenient, right? We right. don't <laughs> have great archaeological evidence. We start seeing... Um, a particular style of pottery called protogeometric pottery kind of showing up Uh um, in the 10th, 9th century over there. And so if you, you know, on a traditional kind of pots equal people model, sure, that's how you explain it. The Greeks showed up, right? Yeah. Um, So I was really interested in in kind of picking apart that notion, which is not really bought into, you know, by most people at this point, but we don't really have a better explanation. So... People say like, well, it probably wasn't a mass migration, but you know, it's still because Greeks came over, right? Um, just in small numbers, you know, at, at different yeah. points in time. 
Um, so I was interested in exploring that. And because due to a number of factors, including silting up of rivers, of which there are three big ones in Ionia, and mm-hmm. the fact that um, later Greeks and Romans sort of continued building on these sites, yeah. preservation of these early materials are not are not very good. Um, and stuff like cooking pots and mm-hmm. other sort of um, unsexy material doesn't tend to get published there. Right. But for identity, that would be a major... Exactly. Major piece of the puzzle because what you're looking at would be the things that actually kind of inform people's daily lives. Exactly. Right? Uh-huh. It's Yeah, spot on. So I wanted to compare what we could sort of determine from the archaeological record in Ionia mm-hmm. with a part of the Mediterranean that was... Um, that had a much larger body of evidence in terms of kind of, you know, cooking ware, evidence of domestic daily Mm. life published um, to sort of, to sort of ask, okay, uh, you know, here's what we have in Ionia. Here's what we have in this case in the Northwestern Mediterranean, not to map interpretations from the Northwest onto Ionia at all, but to kind of use it to fill in potential interpretive avenues for Ionian data that's yeah. that's missing. And also yeah. to sort of identify what kinds of data might be helpful to have from Ionia that, mm-hmm. you know, projects might be holding on to, not really interested in, not publishing, to illustrate the potential of that data, yeah, to answer yeah. some of these big questions that Maybe we to still try have. To help galvanize people in the field to exactly. start paying more attention to this exactly. type of data. Yeah, please publish your <laughs> Iron Age cooking pots. <laughs> I would love to see them. What, what does the Ionian world look like as, as it forms, um, let's say, by like five or 600 BC? And how is that different from, say, Emporion in, uh, in northeastern Spain? Um, sure, in terms of kind of social organization, yeah, everyday yeah. life. Yeah, so, um, I mean, there are some significant differences and also, you know, some, some broad similarities. So I would say, you know, in... in at the turn of the fifth century, mm-hmm. Ionia is uh, very well connected to the Aegean. It also seems to be, you know, and it's considered Greek by people who live in the or people who write about it from yeah. the Aegean. Um, but also engaged in trade relations with, you know, interior Anatolia. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a number of polis of city states that are scattered up and down the coast. Um, the vast majority, you know, 90% of Ionian cities are, are coastal cities with ports. Mm-hmm. Um, so trade has definitely long been something that they're relying on. And in terms of, you know, the social milieu, we have, I mean, it's evidence for language is hard, but we yeah. have, or archeological yeah. evidence for language is hard, but it does seem like it's a pretty multilingual space in terms of um, the names that people have that they're giving their children in terms of um, evidence that we have from a slightly earlier period. There's a, um, there's a poet named Hipponax mm-hmm. from the seventh century who um, is you know, it's only fragments that are preserved. It's mostly sort of body poetry. Yeah. He likes to write kind of crude things that make fun of people who have been rude to him. Um, but he seems he seems to do a fair bit of code switching between Greek oh, and then cool. sort of pulling in words from um, languages from neighboring regions. The implication being that the people who are hearing or reading his stuff mm-hmm. are familiar with with those words, with some yeah, components of those languages. There's a diverse audience that he's exactly, to. yeah, exactly. And Which would yeah. that include like Phrygia and Lydia and Lycia and those yeah. sorts of places? Yeah, exactly. So, um, Caria, Phrygia, Lydia uh-huh. are all definitely um, sort of major interaction partners yeah. with the Ionian cities, and we know um, actually in the sixth century at Ephesus. Uh, the the really monumental temple of Artemis is constructed mm-hmm. with this massive forest of columns. It's not much to see today, but it was very impressive when yeah. it was built. And Croesus, the king of Lydia, donated all of the columns 
So, you know, this, this well-known monarch from a neighboring region yeah. gave them the money and the resources to put all of these up. And in fact, there's an, a, an inscribed sort of plaque that tells us that he did this. Um, so there's heavy interaction going on. Yeah. That's definitely not an impression that I would say I've gotten over time just reading history books. Um, I definitely had this perception of Ionia as being very firmly Greek. Yeah. And very not like anybody else in Anatolia. And and I I guess I imagined if there was interaction, it was probably mostly just in terms of, say, resistance to Persian expansion later in the millennium. Absolutely. Kind of um, yeah, there I mean there's much more, you know, if you if you Google like map of Ionia or something, as mm-hmm. with most maps of ancient things, you'll get a blob map yeah. with very kind of stark lines yeah. drawn between regions, implying there's no permeability, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is not the case, even when we do have, you know, walls um built by the Romans, you know, to keep yeah. people out. Yeah. Uh, Hadrian's Wall. There's a lot of permeability across that yeah. physical barrier, and it's certainly the same case in Ionia, where there's no physical barrier. And and I would assume that compared with a modern border, with without those that scale of institution, I would imagine that it's much more of a gradient between, say, uh, Miletus, and then as you walk inland and start to get out of that that Greek sphere, there's probably not much of a hard line in a lot of cases, right? Exactly. I mean, that's how I would describe it. As you've pointed out, this isn't something that gets talked about, you know, with the same... It, this is sort of a minority topic of discussion uh-huh. within the broad field of scholarship. So we don't... And it's it's hard. Evidence for this is difficult, which is why, partly why. But yeah, that's exactly how I would describe it. Let's flag the evidence part, because that's definitely something to get into. But first, can we now jump over to... The Northwest Coast. I'm kind of curious, by comparison, what that world looks like in the same time period. Definitely. It is, well, the main similarity, I think, is that you've got a very culturally diverse place where yeah. people, you know, are habituated. They, they, have, they have ingrained habitus, sort of daily practices that come from a mix of cultural traditions. Yeah. From um, kind of colonial influence uh, trade influence from both Greeks and Phoenicians, perhaps mm-hmm. even Etruscans, um, and you know local indigenous non-colonial populations. So that cultural mixing is very similar. Um, the actual landscape of sort of settlements that we would call Greek mm-hmm. is quite different. So the primary focus of Greek settlements in the region is between Massalia and, or between modern Barcelona and Marseille. Yeah. Um, yeah. there aren't great harbors running down the coast. I can't remember if it's Strabo or Libby. I think Strabo. One of them talks about this. He, in, in his writing. Complaining about the lack of nice harbors. He or... says, you know, coming up, coming up from the southern tip of you know, what is today the Iberian Peninsula, Um, like there are no good harbors, but then you get to, you know, to Emporian and Uh (laughs) it's much better. Massalia is founded first about 50 years later. Um, Emporian is, scare quotes, founded. That's a complicated story um, that I'm happy to get into in brief or at length. Um, (laughs) And then, you know, the other Greek Greek colonies over there, so um, Rodope or... uh, Rhodes, uh, mm-hmm. um, Agathe, these are Olbia, these are founded by Massalians, by Massalian Greeks already living there. So there's yeah. really only one major foundation and then a small Everything cluster of others. Out, exactly. From there. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but it's, you know, it's a very, the Greeks are basically clinging to the coast. Yeah. And the rest of the region is Celtic, Celt Iberian. Um, sort of. there's a, there's a mix. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we have, in terms of language families in Southern France, you've got, um, uh, Ligurians. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's sort of, it's murky, but yeah. Um, Celtic, Celt Iberian, Ligurian. Um, there's a whole mix of, people that we basically understand in a way that's filtered through later Greek and Roman authors. So, you know, the terms we have for them are murky, but it's a pretty diverse place. When you said that Emporion wasn't really founded, I'm guessing there was already a town there when they got there? Yeah, so they... um, It's sort of a two-part settlement. There's... Mm -hmm. um, It's now all on the mainland, but originally uh, the earliest settlement is called the Palaeopolis or the Old City. Uh Um, And it's on this small offshore island. 
not very far offshore today. It's, you know, it's on land. Um, but it seems to have been, you know, a local indigenous settlement uh-huh. um, that starts trading with, you know, Phoenicians, um, probably getting some Etruscan stuff in with the Massalians. Then there's evidence that some Massalian craftspeople and perhaps merchants come to actually join the community. Yeah. Um, and then... Right, so it's not like they're they're conquering the no. town and establishing a Greek outpost or something. Absolutely it's not. Just, it's more like Greek people filtering in over time to an already bustling community. Ex- exactly. Right? So, you know, it's pretty. It's a small community at that point. Like, the mm-hmm. footprint is pretty small. Um, but, uh, you know, two or three decades later, they moved to the mainland. Yeah. They found kind of the new city, the Neapolis. And this uh-huh. is what's considered sort of the Greek... I'm making scare quotes, the Greek yeah. <laughs> colony. Um, but it's a very it's a very mixed community. And mm-hmm. that's reflected even in ancient authors. Both Strabo and Livy talk about this. They describe sort of a, a city, a two like a dual city with walls separating the Greek and the indigenous populations, for which there's no archaeological <laughs> evidence. Um, but even, you know, that idea of it being a mixed city is, is preserved in sort of very traditional hmm, writing yeah. too. Would, would, would that have been, is that kind of a later perspective that other Greeks might have helped kind of create? Like maybe there's more of a distinction than the people who actually experienced it that's, felt while they were there? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a good question. So, you know, Livy is a Roman author. The, Livy and Strabo are writing at the same time, sort yeah. of around the turn of, of the first millennia, BC and CE. Um, Strabo is from Western Anatolia. Mm-hmm. Uh, Livy is Roman. Um, and I talked about this with my students actually in class yesterday. Uh they have they have they bet- between them they have pretty different takes on it. So hmm. Strabo says, you know, they were living within a single enclosure with a wall between them <laughs> because uh, the the Indiket, the local tribe, wanted like the safety of sort of Greek protection. Yeah. And eventually, they came up with this like hybrid code of laws that was both, you know, he calls them barbarian, barbarian and Greek. Mm-hmm. Whereas Livy's like. Uh, the Greeks were really afraid of them. Um, they wouldn't let any of the uh, the English translation is Spaniards, but he wouldn't let any of the locals into the city. Yeah. Um, only they only did trade with them, but the Greeks were allowed into you know into the local native city um, because they had to help them with seafaring. So he makes it a much more kind of antagonistic story, and I don't know what explains that difference, and yeah. I don't know you know, what perspective your average, you know, person, Greek involved in trade, like in yeah. the Aegean, or even at Massalia would have thought of, yeah, yeah. of, yeah, the nature of Emporian. But there's no wall, there's no, no. evidence of violence. Um, no, no, yeah. not at all. <laughs> the, the way that you look at things then is, um, it's a lot more, I guess, it seems like pragmatic. It's a lot more focused yes. on what people are actually doing and who they're interacting with. And ceramics are your main window into that right yeah so, for the most guess, part talk me through how you're comparing ceramics and what they're actually what they're saying sure so um well first i uh want to sort of be clear that the a, a lot of the interpretive work um that's the foundation for what i'm talking about in terms of communities mm-hmm. has already it, you know is work that's the groundwork for that has been done by Spanish and Catalan scholars. Mm -hmm. So there's a very robust scholarly tradition there of the application of anthropological theory of, you know, investigating, publishing everything from very nice sort of painted, imported, you know, Greek vases to the grubbiest cooking pot you can find. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my colleagues, Ana Delgado and Mary Chell Ferrer have done, um, you know, among others working at Emporian have done a lot of, of work on this and they've written in particular a lot about it, um, including in English, which is sort of a nice access point for students and things like that here. So what they're doing and what I'm kind of plugging into this communities framework is looking at the, um, co-presence in the material record of types of daily use pottery from different cultural traditions, from different traditions yeah. of practice. And, and, and your term for that, right, is functional redundancy, right? Yeah, that's that's what I call it. So basically the idea that you have 
evidence preserved for two different ways of doing the same thing. Yeah. When those yeah. sort of ways, when those, the types of vessels you're using to boil your water or cook your grains or eat, you know, whatever, yeah. come from different practical traditions of pottery manufacture. If there's no practical necessity, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes people are, are, forced to change their habits for whatever reason sometimes you know they don't they lose access to a certain thing right and so they start using kind of a cognate but yeah when there's no practical necessity for it Mm -hmm. i basically argue that you know in that case either a person will continue to use um you know what they've been habituated to since they were a child or if they do sort of adopt something else into their repertoire that's because they've had close enough prolonged contact with someone who's habituated to that right. sort of yeah. community of practice that they've picked up on it, either because they're neighbors, because they're members of the same household, you mm-hmm. know. Because of intermarriage. And it, things exactly. And, yeah. they're, they're, they're living, you know, they must have been living for some period of time in very yeah. close proximity. Yeah. And... Uh, are, you, are you taking those all from, I guess, probably domestic context then? at Emporion and Miletus and places like that? Yeah, so the domestic record is um, much more robust in Iberia than Mm -hmm. it is in Ionia. There's um, a deposit from the dates between the 11th and the 9th century from um, the Artemisian at Ephesus that appears to be an Iron Age feasting context or sort of ritual ritual feasting context at the sanctuary, and that contains a whole bunch of cooking pots and a whole bunch of sort of individual like eating and drinking sets, kind of small bowls that could be yeah. multifunctional um, and some sort of skiff away, some like very classic drinking cups. Uh, and there, what's interesting is that like most of this, st- it's all made locally pretty much, mm-hmm. um, or some of it's imported from Athens, but most of it's made locally. Um, but some of the locally made stuff doesn't look anything like other geographically local pottery. It looks like things that we find at Hattusha, things that we okay, find at yeah, Gordian, things yeah. that we find at Troy. Um, and so, you know, that's a non-domestic context, but you're still looking at kind of eating, drinking, cooking ware in yeah. that in that instance. So that's, you know, an exception, but yeah, everything pretty much comes from domestic contexts in, in, um, Spain and in Southern France. And so in, in Spain and Southern France, are you finding that there's pretty clear delineations between different groups or are you finding kind of a, a melting pot, kind of a households that are blending a lot of different traditions? It seems to be, um, well, it seems to be a mix of things. Uh So the material that's published from Emporian appears to be majority kind of local indigenous in terms of cooking pots, storage vessels, um, with the sprinkling in of a few a few kind of specialized Greek cooking vessels Mm -hmm. um, for, you know, uh, like steaming fish, sort of casserole dishes, things like that. Um, But I mean, in terms, so in terms of delineating between sort of Aegean Greek style cooking pots versus local cooking pots, Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're like those traditional, like traditions of, of production of that pottery. They're very distinctive. Mm. Um, And, you know, an eating where too. So like the wheel is introduced uh, when Phoenicians and Greeks kind of arrive, but doesn't necessarily catch on for producing local pottery. Yeah. Um, So it's pretty easy to differentiate between the influence on certain things. Um, But then, yeah, households seem to be pretty, we see a lot of, a lot of mixing. And, you know, the thing, one of the things that comes up a lot there was just a paper published uh, about Monte Iato, which is a major indigenous site on Sicily. Mm-hmm. By um, It's got a number of authors, but the lead author is Birgit Ullinger, who, um, who works there with the German and Austrian teams. And she and her colleagues have basically argued that, you know, finding sort of Greek imports um, in feasting contexts tells us mostly about status, about sort of social differentiation among people who are members of the same sort of what we call an ethnic community. Yeah. And Ana Delgado and Mary Chell Ferrer have said the same thing for Emporian, that, you know, having these Greek pots in these houses, probably based on kind of other contexts that we have, 
isn't about showing off a Greek identity. It's about showing off or about sort of it, it displays your connectedness. Right. How it's plugged more like in you cosmopolitan are. Cosmopolitan. Exactly. Trans Mediterranean sort of thing. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So I mean, you know, we can't make assumptions about how they perceive themselves, you know, in a way that we that we'd call ethnically, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, the pottery doesn't necessarily relate to that either, right? Yeah. It's more about social status. Are there any common patterns between the way that identities form or are retained on both the eastern and western ends of the Mediterranean? I think a lot about communities of practice mm -hmm. and sort of looking for, right, for these functional redundancies, for mm -hmm. overlap in the way that that people are doing things in kind yeah. of different ways in the same physical spaces. And I would say, you know, in in both regions, um, what we would call maintenance practices, things that are required to kind of sustain basic, you know, everyday tasks for food, shelter, kind of um, things like that. Yeah. Those are a really important component of thinking about sort of people's identities. And those tend to be conserved. Mm -hmm. Um for the longest period of time, right? The way people cook food, unless they're forced to change, is one of the last things to change when they're exposed to outside influence. Um, so, Like the way that, say, an immigrant family, three generations later, there's still those, those family recipes that have, you know... Exactly. ...descended. You know, and you wind up, of course, getting really interesting kind of fusion food ways. Um, segue to cookbooks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Priya Krishna, who's a food writer... Um, published a book with her mother called Indian Ish. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, her parents both um, emigrated from India. Um, she and her sister were born here. They grew up in Texas. And so, you know, the cookbook, first of all, it's a great cookbook, and I recommend it to anyone. Priya is a fantastic writer. The recipes are wonderful. But, uh, you know, she's sort of touching on that idea of things being passed down, but also adjusting a little bit to your circumstances, right, yeah. with her title. So yeah. you can get some of the same ingredients, but not all of them. She talks about making sag paneer, but they use feta instead of paneer because they actually prefer it, right? Sort of yeah. all these little things. So, you know, you do get that fusion, right? But certain components of that habitus of the way you're used to doing things yeah. are retained. Yeah, certain things linger longer. Exactly. Yeah. Going forward, what do you... Uh... What kind of questions and topics do you hope to touch on with this kind of work? So I'm going really big picture. And my plan is to write a monograph that tackles the issue of migration in the Mediterranean very broadly from both a geographic and a, a temporal angle. So... What I want to do is is take several regions of the Mediterranean, um, part of the Maghreb in North Africa, oh, wow. West yeah Western Anatolia where Ionia is, um, Sicily and South Italy, which is a tr treasure trove of, um, of archaeological material and sort of migration yeah. events, and the Northwestern Mediterranean where I've where I've you know been looking at stuff from Emporian, from Massalia, from um, Latara. And to kind of take temporal cores from each of those regions. So look at sort of successive migration events. I mean, successive, separated by centuries in many cases, but yeah, sort of yeah. um, temporally successive migration events in each of those regions. And to look at how migration has really fundamentally shaped the cultural landscape, the human landscape of the Mediterranean for millennia. I mean, Mediterranean migration seems to have been a major factor in the spread of the Neolithic mm -hmm. to yeah. Western Europe. Um, so, you know, literally shaping the foundations of what human civilization looks like today in, in, in all of Europe. Um, There's a kind of interesting quality to, to maritime settings where on the one hand, they're a barrier, but on the other hand, they're a highway. Exactly. Right? I think it really depends on how, at least in terms of the Mediterranean, it's being used. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose for, for rivers, it's the same thing. So, you know, rivers can act certainly as sort of barriers to moving fluidly through a landscape. Yeah. People who live on either side usually find a way to cross them and interact. But if you're yeah. trying to like move an army into Gaul, for example, right. <laughs> a river might provide, might prove problematic. Yeah. Um, they're, you know, they're highways for people who want to move goods mm -hmm. 
you know, inland from the ocean and in, or from the sea. And in fact, we see that uh, a lot in all three of these regions that I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of thinking about the Neolithic, for example, or modern migration, it's very challenging to move from point A to point B across the Mediterranean. It's not a particularly friendly sea. Hmm. Um, it's convenient to sort of leapfrog your way along the coast, making a bunch of stops, right? Sort of engaging in, and I guess we called cabotage, um, mm. you know, stopping in each trading port, selling some stuff, picking up some new stuff, swapping out crew members and moving from point A to point B with a million stops along the way, which is, you know, the kind of trade that we tend to see um, within and between regions in the ancient Med, certainly. And that, that interplay between different regions of the Mediterranean, of the ancient Mediterranean, really is, it seems like one of the core themes of your work, right? Really yeah. pan-Mediterranean. Yeah, trying to, get, trying to get sort of a geographically well-rounded spread um, yeah. for reasons that are deeply uh, colonialist and racist. <laughs> um, I mean, those two intersect. Uh, North Africa is routinely ignored by scholars thinking about these things. If, I mean, if folks who work in the Mediterranean want to keep, continue to be relevant, we have to be able to talk about the whole Mediterranean. And speaking of subjects that are relevant to the whole Mediterranean world today, this seems like one of them, given the immigration crisis that has defined the Mediterranean for the last decade or so. I would, I would assume that having the whole tapestry, having a, that in your head, the image of successive migrations and melding of identities across time in the ancient Mediterranean probably shapes the way that you see this issue today, right? Exactly. To sort of have that whole tapestry and to have a more detailed understanding of how how migration has really shaped the Mediterranean that we see today. And our modern conception of migration, I think, is that migration is a crisis. Right. Um, you know, the movement of people causes a crisis. And right, because sort of, there's an inherent conflict to it in the way people perceive it. Exactly. Because there's, there's ethnic group A and there's ethnic group B, and the two are, like, tied to the associated cultures. And so any mixing of the people is a clash of the cultures. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, we have the, we have the really relatively modern recent notion of the nation state and yeah. this idea that, yeah. you know, even, even if a nation state itself isn't ethnically, religiously homogenous, yeah. um, the, the makeup of the nation state as it is should sort of stay the same. Right, right, it right. It shouldn't, you know, like <laughs> yeah. this this idea that they're not fluid because we've yeah, drawn they're static. Fa- yeah. yeah, exactly, that there's that they're these static things. And yeah. so, you know, I've sort of would advocate flipping this issue on its head and saying, you know, people have people have always migrated. Yeah. That's how humans function. Yeah. Um the landscape that we see today, take the Mediterranean as a case study, is what it is. Our nation states are what they are, even if you view them as static, because of historical migration. Right. So the crisis is not that people are moving. The crisis is one we've manufactured because of the way or because of our unwillingness to um, receive migrants, yeah. Yeah. right? There's no infrastructure for right. it. Right. And this, this gets, I, I think, to the the modern relevance of, of, of your work that... Uh, understanding how how different communities and groups of people kind of come together and form new communities. I know that in political science, a big topic of debate is why do some nations process immigrants better than others? Why in some places is immigration associated with more political radicalism, social strife, inequality, but not in others? And it seems like this gets to the heart of that, seeing how these patterns of migration played out across time. Yeah, th- I mean, that's what I would really like for it to do. Yeah. Um, you know, writing, when you're when you're doing academic writing, right, you always have to think about your audience, whether yeah. it's a journal article, whether it's a monograph, whether yeah. it's a research paper for, for a seminar. Um, and so the challenge is going to be figuring out kind of how to, how to wind up, you know, how to write a monograph like this that's pitched at several different audiences. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, 
talking with folks who work on modern migration issues, whether it's, you know, from a legal perspective, whether it's from an aid perspective, um, people, I've, I've been really pleasantly surprised at how, like, relevant people who work on this stuff in the present day seem to think that the ancient past could be, which, yeah. I mean, I think it's relevant, but you're yeah. used to having to convince people of this. So that's really exciting. And getting to have kind of conversations with all of those folks and to learn from their perspective and sort of think about how to flip it back to the past is really yeah. interesting, too. If, if people wanted to read more about, uh, I guess, in, in particular, ancient Greek migrations, who are some researchers who you might recommend that they go and look for? Um, or, or sites, I guess, as well that um, highlight this stuff? particularly well what do you think people should go look at yeah um so i would say if you're looking for big picture take on ancient mediterranean migration and yeah. how we can think about them especially from a post-colonial perspective mm -hmm. uh peter van damelen is a major go-to yeah. um you know and he's he's written sort of big overview pieces i think he's got one in world archaeology um, I can send you these specific references. Uh, and he's also sort of looked more, he's got a bunch of articles, you know, looking at kind of case studies, thinking about, yeah, um, yeah. Phoenician, Phoenicians and, in, in uh, Sardinia and things like that. Um, in terms of thinking about how we look at interactions between people who have migrated, especially Phoenicians yeah. and local communities. Um, Ana Delgado and Marichel Ferrer have written a number of articles um, on a variety of different sites, yeah. uh, thinking about sort of um, frequently about Punic interactions um, or Phoenician interactions, but also um, interactions with Greeks at places like Emporian. They've written both together and individually, and their work is wonderful. Um, in terms of ancient colonization, which is, you know, sort of relates to migration in terms of how we talk about it. Michael Dietler is another major scholar. Mm -hmm. Um, he's really a specialist in Southern France and he, uh, has, um, a great book on this and he's got an edited volume, um, so that he did with Carolina Lopez Ruiz, who's written a lot about kind of Phoenician diaspora. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so those are some of my suggestions for good places to start and all people who are prolific. So it's easy to uh, sort of find more things to find something by them and then kind of mine their bibliography for yeah. other things they're yeah. referencing that are really relevant. Awesome. Thanks. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll definitely compile a bunch of those and I'll put them in the show notes that I, uh, I'll stick online on my sure. website. So yeah, people I can... will have all the citations and things with timestamps so they can, uh, they can track them all down. Perfect. Uh, awesome. Well, thanks for talking with me, Katie. Thank you so <laughs> much, really Sebastian. Cool. <laughs> this was a lot of fun. And thank you for listening to this episode of The Tell. Until next time. Hey everybody, if you enjoyed the podcast and you want to help me talk to more people in more places, please consider donating. You can do so on my Patreon as a recurring donor, as well as on my website if you'd rather do a one-time donation. The links are patreon.com slash Sebastian Weatherby and www.sebastianweatherby.com. Show notes are also available on my website, where you can find citations and comments and other relevant information about the things we talked about today. Thanks again for listening.